Hi, welcome to Mel's Health. I'm Mel, it's lovely to have you here. So today is gonna follow directly on from my story part one, where I explained to you guys everything that happened on the day I had to go to hospital with some severe respiratory symptoms and got diagnosed with pulmonary embolism. So where I left you guys, I had been given the news from the doctor in my local hospital that they were pretty sure that I had blood clots in my lungs and I had pneumonia on top. So they'd started me on some blood thinners and given me some antibiotics too for the pneumonia. And I was gonna have to go via ambulance transfer to the city because I needed a CT scan, which they don't have available at my local hospital. And I was also told that I was gonna have to go alone due to the pandemic, my other half can come with me. And uh, this is where the story starts. I'd currently been in my local hospital for a couple hours. She's given me that news and we follow on from there. So it's about another hour and then the lady from the ambulance team rocks up and speaks to the doctor and then they come into my room. The doctor's like, did you manage to get hold of your partner? I was like, yeah, yeah, I called him. And then the ambulance lady just turns around and goes, he's in the ambulance bay. I was like, excuse me. <laughs> She's like, yeah, he's standing in the ambulance bay. He's like, he wasn't going to leave until he got to see you. So what we're going to do is will you outside while we sort all your paperwork out so you'll have about five minutes with him and then when we're ready to go we'll just put you in the ambulance ready to leave i was like god love that boy it was the best news ever at that point i was so happy he stayed so anyway ambulance obviously happens off i go and then uh, i rock up to the er in the city and then i'm taken pretty much straight through to the apartment admitted sent through for the ct scan it's probably like 11 o'clock at night at this point as well um I had an IV in my arm, so they flushed me with the dye that they used to flush you with so that they can see everything on the CT that they need to see. I will do another video where I actually talk a little bit more in depth about the different scans that I've had because it'll be a lot of information to take in if I do it all at once right now. Um, but yeah, I have the CT, they flush me with the dye um, and then send me back to the ER to be in my little cubicle for the night. And then um, I think just before midnight, doctor comes along and says, you know, they've confirmed it through the CT. I've got a lot of clot in both lungs, large clots as well is what he said. And uh, they were just going to continue me on the blood thinners and be constantly monitoring me for the first night. So literally my blood pressure was being taken constantly. It was like this automated machine that they hooked me up to and it would just automatically inflate on your arm and then the nurse would note the... Uh, the numbers and then there was nurses coming in taking bloods from me i think i had probably had about four hours ish uninterrupted where i got some sleep and then i was woken up at like 5 a.m the following day um with more bloods being taken another ecg happening they hooked me up to the machines again um but that was day one so day two i'm taken to a different area of the emergency department i think it was the diagnosis area and uh, I'm told that I'm going to be having two sets of ultrasounds that day. And I go and have an ultrasound of my heart and top of my abdomen. And then they do an ultrasound of both my legs, my thighs really. Um, a little question actually, when I was having the heart ultrasound, um, it was cold jelly. And when they did the leg ultrasound, it was warm jelly. What's the difference? Anybody know? Let me know. <laughs> But I um, had those scans and then I was put up onto a ward just after lunch and then I met my doctor that would be dealing with me the rest of the time that I was in hospital. So he comes along and he tells me that I'm not going home that day. So I'm gonna have to spend another night in hospital because he didn't wanna send me home, something happened and then feel terrible. Uh, so we're having a chat and uh, this is the first time that I will have ever mentioned anything to do with my dad, but it is a quite a large part of what actually got me to this point. Um, I started talking to the doctor about the fact that my dad is on warfarin for life. And uh, I didn't actually know much about it myself. I've always known that he's on it and that he had some sort of blood clot issue, um, but I've never really spoken in depth about it because when he was going through anything like that, I was really quite small. Um, so it's just something that he's always just managed. Um, and it's not really been a massive deal or a massive effect on me. When it came to me being on the oral contraceptive pill, it's something I've always mentioned to my GP, but I've never missed like a BP check when going in to get my prescription for it or anything like that, and I wasn't showing any other risk signs. 
Um, so being on the contraceptive pill for like 17 years has just there's been no issue up to this point. But obviously I'm no longer allowed to take that and it was one of the first things that he told me. Um, so I was in my pill free re week when this happened so it was just don't take any more. And then we got my mum and dad on FaceTime in the hospital and then my dad held up this card that he has and he has a protein S deficiency. So as soon as the doctor um, saw that then I started to have blood tests go for the which is known as the genetic testing portion um, because it could be a hereditary condition that was passed on from my dad. I had a protein S deficiency when the test came back but it was only ever so slightly and they were worried that because all of my levels were currently elevated while I was in hospital because I was kind of in trauma um, it wasn't a true reading of whether I had a deficiency or not so even though it was showing that I did it wasn't at a level that was worrying for them so at this point they're thinking it might have just been the oral contraceptive pill that was the biggest factor in me getting these blood clots. Um, so after chatting with the doctor a bit more and then giving him kind of a full overview of everything about me, what happened, what brought me to here and everything, he basically just tells me, no, I'm not allowed to mountain bike because if I bang my head or cut myself or anything, then while I'm on blood thinners, it's not going to be a good outcome. The head banging more than anything, the, if I cut myself, I'm just going to bleed and it's not going to be great. Um, but if you bang your head while you're on blood thinners, then if you have internal bleeding and then go to the hospital, it's going to be really difficult for them to be able to help with that. Um, depending on the half-life of the drug you're on and everything, it'd be different, different timings and different methods of treatment before they'd be able to help. But it's just something that you want to avoid uh, whilst taking blood thinning medication. So I was pretty down. I was just basically told, you know, I can't spend any time mountain biking and I was told about how long the recovery could be. Um, he was pretty sure that I would end up on my blood thinning medication for at least six months because he was shocked at the amount of clot that there actually is in me, um, blocking up both lungs. Um, and then he tells me that from He'll come back tomorrow, but he was pretty much going to be referring me to thrombosis clinic and once I get discharged from the hospital, they will be taking on my treatment from here on out. So after that chat, I was moved up to a ward and then I find out that my ultrasounds were pretty clear. They couldn't find anything in my legs, so they were like, I don't, they'd have no idea where the pulmonary embolism would have come from. Um, but my heart function was pretty good, I hadn't done any um, long term damage that they could see from having the severe uh, right sided heart dysfunction the previous day. It looks like everything was kind of going well in that department. They also tested me as I believe they do with everyone for the antiphospholipid syndrome, I really hope I said that right, um, and I don't have that and uh, I will speak about that again in a different video, but it's basically a autoimmune disorder. So people can be worse off if they do have that. So then day three happens. I was pretty much just left after having a chat with the doctor that day. I just see nurses for the regular checkups and get my meals. Um, Everybody who comes in to see me keeps their absolute distance and it was a bit like being in the films because every health professional that came around me was in this like fluorescent yellow PPE um, because I was a possible COVID patient at that point as well um, and everyone was keeping their distance. It was just it was like watching Contagion. Everyone didn't know one wanted to be close to me. They had said to me at one point that the levels in my blood showed how severe the strain on my heart was and that has been seen with someone who has usually had a heart attack or COVID um, and also blood clots but because of that result that came back and the amount of strain on my heart nobody was kind of ruling out the, uh, the possibilities at that point so I could have been COVID patient and everyone was doing their best to keep their absolute distance from me and keep me away from everybody else. I was in my own little private room, uh, just left alone uh, for about 24 hours. So the final day, day three, I get told this day that I can go home. Um, doctor comes in and he's not wearing any PPE, no mask, no bright yellow outfit. And uh, that's a great sign. So you know what that means. I tested negative, yay. <laughs> 
Um, but there's obviously a lot more serious things going on with me, so I'm glad that was a negative, but still had pneumonia, still had a giant clots in both lungs, so he gave me all the documents I would need as he's referred me over to thrombosis clinic, that would be in the city as well, and then gave me a prescription for the time being for the antibiotics for me to see the week out for the pneumonia, and a prescription for a Pixaban, aka Eliquis, which is the blood thinner that I was originally given. And he said that the thrombosis clinic would be getting in touch with me within the next few days to book an initial appointment with me and they would be taking over my care from here on out. So that was my ordeal from start to leaving hospital right at the very beginning. My prescription for antibiotics was just for the remainder of the week, so six more days. I will most definitely do a video sometime soon on the medications that I've been given throughout this process because um, I did stay on the Apixaban for the first six months um, but it didn't really do too much for me. I did stay on the same dose the whole time, didn't really see a whole lot of improvement and then when I had my six months review this scan showed that I still had all of the clots that I still had six months prior. Um, so they switched me to warfarin and it's been a little over a month that I've been on that now which is still trying to get my INR levels and everything and that sorted. It's not really going that brilliantly either at the minute I will admit but I will focus more on that in that video where I speak about the medications. I'll also talk about the cost of them because they're not cheap. Warfarin I found is a lot cheaper than the Apixaban but I was shocked by how expensive the Apixaban actually was and I'd love to hear what it's like in other countries. Um, I'm not quite sure how I'm gonna link the other stuff in. I'm definitely gonna do a video about the different scans that I've had but I wanna link it into maybe talking about the cause of the clots as well um, around the oral contraceptive pill and then I'll talk more about the genetic testing that I had as well with my protein S deficiency and the follow-up that they did from that. Um, but today was more just I wanted to kind of give you that story that initial experience that I had um, getting diagnosed so I hope that it's kind of helped you see that you know this is what I went through this is what I was feeling um, and if the process that you received in hospital was anything similar to mine um, I'd be interested to know. I do thank you very very much for listening and watching and I hope you're feeling better than I am right now. Um, but I do have a lot more information that I want to get across to you guys, things that I've taken in over the last six months, things that I'm still feeling now and things that I'm going through. Um, I really do hope that it is helping people out there kind of bring in an understanding to stuff that you're going through and uh, I'd love to know if you can relate to this in any way at all. Uh, join my Discord server if you want to have a chat with me at any point, the link is below as is the link to my Patreon and other things that you can see, any other references that I've used throughout this video that'll all be provided down there. And once again, if you found any of this useful or helpful, then please do like the video and subscribe to the channel for more content. It really does help the channel, believe me. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you soon. Bye.